Beckett. I am the student ministry director at Seven Rivers Church, and it is a risk to invite me to come speak to you guys this morning. I'm excited to uh, get to share with you God's word. Uh, we'll be in Luke chapter 15 if you want to open your Bibles and turn there, but I'll introduce myself just a little bit. Uh, I have uh, two kids, uh, Trip and Blakely. Uh, my wife's name is Emily. A little bit about our story. Um, our firstborn, Blakely, was born with special needs. Uh, she had this disease called Alivar holoprosencephaly. Uh, ended up uh, resulting in the two hemispheres in her brain not dividing properly. And uh, she ended up getting to live with us for nine and a half months when the doctor said that she wasn't going to live a day. So it was, it was a gift to have her um, she blessed us. Uh, we miss her. And I'll be sharing a little bit about her uh, in the sermon, but also uh, I've, I've also been here before and shared my story with you guys um, as well. And um, you guys have always been gracious and kind to me, um, which has been really, um, really sweet. And now I have a one-year-old named Trip, and he is a mess. Uh, he, on his, he turned one a month ago, and he, as we were singing happy birthday to him, holding the cake, in front of him, he decided um, to push it over off, off, uh, off our hands um, onto the floor. But we got him back because we still fed him the cake from the floor. So he has no idea. Uh, he will one day have an idea, and I'm sure he'll pay us back later um, in life. Uh, so it's a little bit about me. Uh, we moved to Citrus County two years ago, and uh, we've loved living here and being here. I love this community uh, and, and love uh, Nature Coast. Um, and Brad and, and, and the ministry that's happening here. It's really, really beautiful and really, really sweet. So without further, uh, the topic of the sermon is the father's love. And I'll read, and I'm going to read to you the story of the prodigal son, 11 through 24. Um, this is God's word. It'll last forever, much longer than our words, much longer uh, than, than the words of our grandkids, great, great grandkids, great, great, great grandkids, uh, our words um, will eventually disappear, but these words will be forever and with us in eternity. So, here is God's word. Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And so he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. And they began to celebrate. This is God's word. It will last forever. A question that I want to ask you guys and want you to think about for just a second is what is a home? What is a home? Home is where... You, your whole self, with all your mess, with all your junk, is wanted. Home is where love runs free with no condition and no restraints. So if you're here this morning and, and you feel lonely, if you're here and you feel like you're chasing, constantly busy, constantly striving, burned out maybe, exhausted, 
hurt, struggling with addictions, if you feel out of control, if you feel like you can't make it one more day, one more week, if you feel like you're about to break, then you're in the right spot. Come as you are. This is home. A little bit of what I'm describing is what I'm going to call the homelessness of the soul. If you're like me, I can feel homeless. I can feel homeless in my soul. I can feel like I have no place to rest, no place to be myself, no place to be safe. You and I, we need a place like this to be loved, to be wanted. With no restraints, no conditions. We need a home. The big idea, if you take one thing away from this talk this morning, is this. The Father love calls you home. I have three points. The first one is lit, the Father's love lets you leave. The Father's love waits for you. And the Father's love wants you. The first point is lets you leave. When we look at the story of the prodigal son, we see that the younger son desires to leave his home. He wants to take his inheritance with him. He comes to his father, asks for his portion. He's communicating to his family that he's done with them. He wants to leave. And the most interesting thing, the most fascinating thing about the story is the father lets him leave. The father lets his son leave home. Do you feel the pain and tension of that statement? Some of you in this room have experienced actually your own kids when they go off to college. You've experienced them leave your home. Or when they jump into the workforce, you experience them leave your home. At least hopefully they leave. <laughs> Maybe they're still staying around. Some of you, maybe with little ones, when they go to kindergarten, you, you experience your child leaving, going to school, spending eight hours away from home. Some of you have experienced your children leave home in the sense of the faith, and you've watched them turn away from God and turn away from Jesus. Some of you, if you're like me, have experienced maybe Losing a child, actually watching a child leave earth, leave home. I remember my first day at kindergarten, my mom was just sobbing. Not because she out of joy and elation that I was growing up and getting out of the house, but because she was having to let me leave, let me grow up. Because she loved me. I remember when I was dropped off at Florida State University, for college, my parents were sobbing, and so was I, even though I don't want to admit that I, um, I missed them. I wanted to, um, them to stay with me. I was, I, was, uh, I was trying to be cool, trying to be a cool college kid, but I was heartbroken because I let them leave, and they had to let me leave, and it was hard because of love. I remember when Blakely passed away, and we sobbed and we cried because we had to let her leave. We didn't want her to go, but we had to. We loved her. When people leave, there is a pain that is felt. Because there's a feeling of loss. And there's a feeling of loss because there is underneath that a constant, consistent love. There is a letting go of something that you love. The father does not know in this story if he will ever see his son again. He actually, he would, should expect to never see his son again as his son has taken his inheritance. The father knows that at this point in the story, this is the last time he will ever see his child. He doesn't hold on to him though. He lets him go. Why? Because his love is enough for his son. His love is enough to allow his son to leave or to stay. God loves you enough to let you leave or to let you stay. He loves you whether or not you leave or whether or not you stay. I've always wondered why God put the tree in the middle of the garden that they couldn't eat from. Why would God place a tree in the garden with fruit that Adam and Eve could not eat from? I've always wondered this question. I feel like this story kind of touches on it. 
The reason is because God loves his children so much that he lets them choose. He doesn't force them to love him. He doesn't force them or program them like robots to love him. He lets them love or he lets them leave. But no matter what, whether they stay in the garden or whether they leave the garden, God loves his children. All of us in this room, we have eaten of the tree. We have sinned. We have, we have rebelled. We have turned away from God over and over again. And the result of that is that we have a homelessness of the soul. We spend our time seeking worth and value in what we do and what we can accomplish and who we can become, and how much money we make, what kind of jobs we have, how many kids we have, what our spouse accomplishes. We find worth in all things, as much as we can find, to prove and to make a case that we are loved. That's why we're tired. That's why we're exhausted. That's why we're worn out. Because we're missing the point. That we are God's beloved children and we have a home. It has nothing to do with what you can accomplish. It has nothing to do with what you're capable of or how much you can add to society. It has nothing to do with your actions. It has everything to do with God's love. The Father's love is not based on whether you leave or stay. Whether you are with him or not, he loves you. His love is constant and present. And his heart breaks when his children leave. We see that the father continues to love his son in the story. Why? Because he waits for his son. My second point is the father waits for you. He lets you leave and he waits for you. When the younger son left home, the father waited upon him. He did not know if he would ever come back. The father waits upon his son because he loves his son. The father just wants for his son to come home, but he will not make him. He will, though, wait, and he waits for you. He will wait for you until the very end. And why does he wait? Because you're his child. You are worth the wait, not because of anything you've accomplished, but because you're simply his little child girl, his little boy. So to the lost sons and daughters in this room, do you realize that someone's waiting for you right now? There's something really simple and beautiful about someone waiting on you. I think about patients when they go under the knife into surgery. Their loved ones, if they're around, they wait upon them. They go under anesthesia, and the odds are you don't, it's a risk. You have to sign your life away when you go under surgery. You don't know if they'll make it through, but you tell each other that you'll wait on each other. The patient waits for their family, and the family waits for them. There's something really beautiful and loving about that picture. I think about one of my elders when we were in St. Louis at our church. One of our elders, his name was Jim Armbrecht. He had a wife who had dementia. And he watched her mind fade away every single day. But every single day he would wait upon her, serve her, feed her, visit her, be with her. And every now and then she would come through. Every now and then. Until the very end. He waited upon her. That is one of the most beautiful pictures of love. People in their mess waiting on each other in their brokenness, in their mess. It's interesting. When I lost my little girl Blakely, I felt like I was waiting for her to come home. 
I still to this day feel like I'm waiting for. And if any of you in this room, and I know you have, if you've lost a loved one, if you think about them right now, it's this feeling of waiting upon them. Even though you know you'll never see them here on earth again, you feel like you're waiting upon them. And the reason why you feel this way is because you still love them. Your love has never stopped, even though they're gone. And if you're anything like me, if anything, your love has only grown for them. Your love is constant, consistent, and this reflects the love of the Father, what he has for you. As you have run from him and you, with your homelessness, your rebellion, the homelessness of the soul, the Father still loves you. He's waiting on you. He will never stop loving you. And there's nothing you can do to stop him. The third point I want to make is the Father wants you. This is kind of hard for some of us to understand. One is because we have maybe had earthly fathers who never wanted us. We wrestle with that. And it's hard to believe that God, the Father, could want us me want you when the youngest son returns home to his father in his house he expects not to be a son but to be a servant because he couldn't fathom couldn't comprehend couldn't believe that his father would ever want him back he expects to be an employee he expects to be a slave a servant and he deserves to be one because he sinned against his dad he's forfeited the right to his sonship but the most beautiful thing about this picture and about this story is that the father sees his son walking down the road and he comes running out to him the son covered in the pig slot the son smelly and messy and broken the son homeless with ragged shoes and clothes is embraced and held by the father kissed put a ring on a robe on and thrown a party for reestablished back into the family we call this grace. The story goes this way because of grace. It would be right and just for the father to run out to the son and say, leave this place. This is not your home. But because of love, because God is love, you are wanted. And all that the father wants is for his children to come home. It has nothing to do with what you can accomplish, do, or, or make with your own hands. It has everything to do with who God is. He is our father, and this will never change. And he is love, and he loves you. He lets you leave, he waits for you, and he lets you come back. This is what love looks like over and over and over and again and again. Love is messy. God lets the mess into his home because it pleases him. Because he loves you and because you are his beloved sons and daughters. I remember when I was in St. Louis for my first semester in seminary. I lived in a basement with very few windows. I didn't have many friends, and I slowly became depressed. I was struggling with addictions. I lost community. I lost touch with reality. I was engaged to my wife, Emily, at the time. And I'm sure it was very hard for her to love me during that season. I remember as I was at my lowest point, I called her on the phone. I said, Emily? Here's all my sin. Here's all my brokenness. Here's everything that I've done. Here is how I'm falling apart. Here's my mess. And I confessed everything to her. I told her everything. And then I said, at the very end, I said, do not marry me. Get as far away from me as possible. And she replied to me, and this changed my life. She said, Mikey. I'm not marrying you because of you, but because Jesus loves you, and so do I. Let's get 
Mary. In that moment, Emily showed me love. She showed me the love of the Father. She showed me what a home looks like. And she embraced me and she said to me, I love you. I did not deserve this. This is grace. Do you know that God wants you home? Do you know that you can come to him with all your brokenness, all your mess, come as you are, share it to him. And yes, you deserve to be separate from him. But he says, no, I love you. And the biggest way that he shows this is in Jesus. If you want proof and say, God, prove to me that I am loved. He says, look at my son, Jesus. Don't you see the holes in his hands, the holes in his feet? I love you. That's what God says to you. We wrestle with this idea of God being our father because a lot of us have a lot of hurt and brokenness with our earthly fathers. Maybe our earthly father was forceful. Maybe he abandoned you. For you to think God as a father is scary. To you, God is more like a boss where you clock in and clock out where you work for him to get your reward. To you, God is angry, wrathful. To, for you, your relationship with God feels like slave ship. You feel like a servant. You have the most difficult time thinking that God can love you like a father loves their son or daughter because you have no earthly representation of that. But this is where this story has hit home for me of the prodigal son. I think about being a father to Blakely and being a father to Tripp, and all of a sudden I'm waking to the emotions and the feelings that the father has for his child who leaves home. I've lost a daughter, she is gone, she has left. I've had to let her go, and to this very moment I still wait for her. I still love her. My heart breaks with the father as I read the story of the child leaving home as he knows that his son may never come back and this is probably the last time he'll ever see him. I hurt so badly with him. I would give anything right now for her, for Blakely, to walk in through those doors and to see her alive. You know what we would do? I'd probably run to her, embrace her, hug her, clothe her, put a ring on her, kiss her, and we would throw the biggest party for her in that moment. Because I thought she was dead, and now she's alive. The father thought you were dead, but now you are alive. You are alive because the father loves you. Because of Jesus. You see, when Jesus, the Son of God, was nailed to the cross, he became the prodigal son. He became the son that left home. He became sin. He became the subject of God's wrath. When Jesus was on the cross, and when Jesus died on that cross, God, his Father, rejected him. He abandoned Jesus on that cross because Jesus took your sin on. Jesus took your homelessness on. His, his father turned his face away from him. His father rejected him so that you could be seen. So that you who were dead in your sin could have life. So that you can come home now. There is space for you at the table because there's someone missing. Jesus has left and made space for you. You receive God's love because of Jesus. You can come home because of Jesus. Your mess, your brokenness, your pain, your hurt, it all matters because the Son of God was broken. Because the Son of God was victimized. Because the Son of God was traumatized and hurt for you. Your life is not meaningless. Your life is not worthless because of your sin. Your life matters because of Jesus. You have a home. You have a father who lets you leave. You have a father who wants you. You have a father who waits for you. Be 
because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. The Father loves you. Come home. How do you do this? How do you do this? What does the prodigal son do when he returns home? He says, Father, I've sinned against you. Let that be your confession this morning. Father, I've sinned against you. Father, once again this week I ran from you. Father, once again this week I rebelled against you. I'm tired. I'm worn out. I'm exhausted. I'm messy. I've sinned against you, Father. Rest in that. Rest that you have a dad who you can come to and share that with. And know that he will feed you, that he will clothe you, and he will take care of you. The Father loves you. You are his beloved children. Let's pray.